Okay, now we want to discuss <coughs> chapter 44, osmoregulation and excretion. And so uh, osmoregulation is um, controlling solute concentrations in body fluids, using osmosis to do that. And it's an important thing that uh, all living things need to do. Um, and so focusing on animals, uh, we see that there are some animals, like the tilapia, which we des describe as an extreme urohaline osmoregulator. And by that, it's unique in that it's able to live in quite a variety of aquatic habitats of varying salt concentrations, but it's able to control its, um, to maintain homeostasis for these salt and solute concentrations inside them in spite of the surrounding conditions. This does not apply to most animals. For example, uh, most fish live either in salt water or fresh water, although again there are some exceptions like tilapia can live in various and think of salmon. Salmon spend part of their lives in salt water and part in fresh, but your typical saltwater fish, for example, is um, existing in relatively hypertonic surroundings so that it basically loses water constantly through osmosis to the surroundings. So therefore it has to drink the seawater to get more water. Well, of course, it's getting a bunch of salt in that way. But what it does is it has mechanisms to both get rid of salt through its gills and through its, its urine. So it basically drinks the seawater and excretes the excess salt. Your typical freshwater fish is living in hypotonic conditions. So it's constantly absorbing water from its surroundings. And so what it has to do is get rid of that excess water and it does it by excreting large amounts of dilute urine. Um, and it has to get the ions it needs, not from the water so much, but from the foods it eats and, and somewhat from the water. But it has, it has to deal more with the shortage of ions often, uh, whereas the um, saltwater fish has to deal with a shortage of water inside of it. Some organisms that live in marine environments, like seagulls, for example, they um, find themselves in conditions where they just have seawater available to them. And, and when that's the case, they have glands that basically extract this excess salt and then excrete it as a very concentrated solution. Um, so these glands, again, use active transport to basically extract the salt from their body fluids, from their circulatory system, and then dump it into these glands. All right, so now land animals, um, of course, uh, you're, you need water. Your cells have a lot of water. You have water in the interstitial fluids between all your cells. And so maintaining a proper balance of the amount of water and the solutes in your fluids is important. And this just gives a couple examples of, of organisms that live in quite different habitats. And so you have this uh, kangaroo rat that lives in dry habitats. So there's not a lot of water available um, to them. And so compared to a human, which we as have to drink lots of water, our evolutionary history is from areas where there's plenty of water. So of course we have to ingest a lot of that water. But this kangaroo rat, you can see virtually gets none of its gets virtually none of its water by drinking it. It gets all of it by recycling water within itself or from the foods that it eats. Um, and you can see here that um, the amount of water, this green section represents evaporation. You can see this rat loses a lot of its water through evaporation relative to the human um, for a couple of reasons, because of course it lives in a very dry habitat, but also because it's a smaller animal, has a larger surface to volume ratio. So there's more surface area relative to its volume, so it just has more surface area over which it can uh, sweat and lose water, essentially. But you see it loses relatively little of its water <coughs> in urine compared to the typical person. The typical person excretes about a liter and a half of water each day. All right, so now nitrogen waste, we of course consume proteins and nucleic acids in our diet and they have nitrogen in them and that can lead to the production of nitrogenous waste, excess amounts of uh, uh, amino groups in particular. And there are th three different ways that animals 
get rid of this stuff. In an aquatic animal, particularly a, a freshwater aquatic animal that excretes large amounts of urine, they excrete the stuff as ammonia, this liquid. Um, now ammonia, if it's too concentrated, can be toxic. So if you're a terrestrial animal, excreting your excess, your nitrogenous waste as ammonia doesn't work so well because you would have to urinate a whole lot and you would dehydrate. So what they do is convert them to other compounds. In the middle one here, this typical mammal, for example, is this is urea. And it's uh, less, less toxic, much less toxic than ammonia, but it's still soluble in, in water. And so we excrete it in our urine as urea. Whereas a f birds um, and reptiles, they excrete it as this material called uric acid, which is less toxic than ammonia. And it's also a solid. And so basically these kinds of animals don't really urinate so much. They just excrete this semi-solid material um, that has this uric acid in it. All right, so when we look at excretory systems, there's some basic components you have. You have your circulatory system, in which you have these materials, particularly these waste materials in from metabolic processes. Then you have a system of tubes that whose job is to first filter out some of the liquid from the bloodstream. You're going to um, reabsorb some of the materials that got filtered out. You'll also have secretion of some materials that were not filtered out initially. And then finally you have excretion of this waste product, this urine. And over here shows an earthworm and how in each segment of the earthworm they have one of these these types of structures, this thing called a metanephridion. And here you can see the circulatory system that surrounds it. And that's where you're going to get filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And then finally, excretion from this tube. And each segment has its own metanephridion where this happens. All right, in the mammalian kidney, so here we are. Um, we see the gross structure of the, the kidney. You've got um, what's called the renal cortex, which is the outer layer. Then you've got the renal medulla, which is the in closer in. Um, the renal pelvis, which is where all the urine is collected, which goes down to the ureter. And the ureter comes from each kidney down to the bladder. And then finally from the bladder out the body through the urethra. Um, now in this cutaway section we see here's the, the renal cortex, the outer layer, and then here's the medulla. And spanning both the cortex and the medulla we have this thing called the nephron. And the nephron is a tube that is again connected to the circulatory system at the structure called the Bowman's capsule, which is kind of where the nephron starts. And inside it is a cluster of capillaries known as the glomerulus. Here filtration is occurs and filtrate is forced out of the, um, the arteries flowing in here by the pressure in that blood. Not all of it, of course, but some of it. And so then that filtrate goes into what's called the proximal tube. Then the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle, the distal tube, then finally the collecting duct, where the urine collects from different nephrons that are feeding into it. All right, let's see what happens in this nephron. So here, again, we are in the cortex, the medulla with the outer medulla and the inner medulla. Here's the renal, one of the arteries coming in here to the glomerulus inside Bowman's capsule, the proximal tube, loop of Henle, and distal tube. And so we see what materials are both flowing out of and into this tube. You notice that you have some active transport, some materials actively being transported out, um, and others just diffusing out, and also others being actively transported in and then diffusing into the tube. So here we have in the proximal tube a lot of reabsorption of nutrients and salts and water and certain ions. And as the filtrate then goes down into the descending loop of Henle, we have a lot of water absorption, reabsorption. And recall that this is all surrounded by a system of blood vessels here, some capillaries. So these materials are flowing both into the cells of the kidney, but also into the bloodstream as well. 
again, this process of reabsorption. All right, now notice over here, we have the active transport of salts in particular out of the tube, both in the ascending loop of Henle and in the um, collecting duct here. And so what that's going to do, and I'll come back to this slide in a second, it's going to increase the osmolarity of the fluids of the cells, both the cells and the fluids around the cells of the kidney, such that as you go deeper into the medulla, you can see the osmolarity increases. That is, the, the solution there becomes more hypertonic. There's more solutes because of the movement, both uh, passively and actively, of salt into that inner medulla. And so that's why you get all this passive transport of water in the descending loop of Henle and the collecting duct. This is where reabsorption of a lot of the water occurs in the kidneys because you have a whole lot of filtrate that is filtered into the tube. Most of that filtrate, most of that liquid is reabsorbed such that the relative amount of urine produced is not that much compared to the amount of filtrate. But essentially the goal of the nephron, again, is to reabsorb nutrients, what you want to keep, but then get rid of those waste materials and concentrate those waste materials such that the urine that's being excreted is going to be much more concentrated than the filtrate that came in. Saving water and getting rid of waste materials. That's sort of the purpose of the nephrons inside the kidney, if you will. <clears throat> okay, a couple more things. Now, in terms of homeostasis, so sometimes you're dehydrated, sometimes you're, um, you're not. And so when you're dehydrated, the osmol you have less water in your system and the osmolarity of the blood increases. That is, that number goes up, the amount of solutes in your blood increases. And when this happens, there's a trigger inside the hypothal hypothalamus that causes a thirst response and also the release of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which has an effect on the um, nephrons such that more water is reabsorbed than would be otherwise. And so this is attempting to get more water into your bloodstream and to decrease that osmolarity. Um, so ADH is involved with osmolarity. Now, you can also have a situation in which you lose blood, that is, the blood pressure decreases. All right, well, in the distal tube, there's this region called the JGA, the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and it essentially senses changes in blood pressure such that when the blood pressure decreases, this structure, again the JGA, produces this material called renin, which gets into your bloodstream, which is converted into this stuff called angiotensinogen and, and angiotensin II. And these essentially are compounds that have a couple effects. First, they um, cause arterial constriction. The, the, the arteries, the small arteries, start to constrict and become a little smaller, which will help to increase blood pressure. And the adrenal glands, the ones that sit on top of your kidneys, you re reach, release this compound called aldosterone. And it stimulates the reabsorption, in particular, of water and some ions as well into the bloodstream. So you constrict the arteries a little bit and increase the reabsorption of water in the hopes of bringing your blood pressure back up. Um, now, of course, if you have massive amounts of blood you've lost, this system is not going to be able to really compensate for that. But if you have, again, there's a certain amount of blood that's been lost, and so this is a, a temporary mechanism to get that blood pressure back up until you can ingest more water and basically get more fluid into your system. Okay, that's it. <laughs>